Okay, this is a recording for posterity, my reaction to the 2022 Sight and Sound list. I'm Sam Smith. I am a poster artist who's worked in film a lot. Um, I'm known as the guy who did that house poster. <laughs> and um, among other things, Ben Folds drummer and some other things I'm known for, possibly also known for tweeting out a prediction of the new upset best film of all time on the Sight and Sound list five minutes before the announcement. I am a little shaky right now because I literally think that just happened. So I'll tell you about it in just a second and how or why and if that happened, we will find out. Wow. Um, but this is such an exciting day. I am obsessed with lists, film, and the Sight and Sound list in particular. I've been waiting for this for 10 years. Any, okay, I'm just a white guy, okay? And there's a horrible, unfair, unjust world out there, right? We all know that. But if you, if art is as important to you as it is to me, and I, I know it is for a lot, anyone watching this probably, if, it's, if anyone ever does watch this, that this means a lot. Um, less that canons and lists are strict, but as an exercise, as a, experiments and as a gateway to discover film and art um i know when i was young and discovering film like these science and lists were so crucial and you know the whole idea of canons right it's like in general right now in 2022 a lot of talk about dismantling the previous canons and the patriarchal structures that you know because they were created in these patriarchal structures which all of the most influential uh, films were created under a patriarchal system that's the big fundamental problem you have here you know uh, everything from citizen kane to parasite right um so it's it's tough because you can't abandon all those films that had such an influence and shaped the art form just because they were created in a system that was patriarchal now BFI Sight and Sound might be bringing a whole bunch of new voters in, I'm sure they are, to have a better, more diverse sense of representation. And we should. That's amazing. So the big question here is like, is the whole canon going to be completely upended here with a new list? Or will we have the stuff like Citizen Kane, Tokyo Story, Rules of the Game, these classics that have always been in the top 10, will they remain, you know? The last 10 years, and I'll just use this as a chance to go over to my what I tweeted. I actually wanted to make a video um, predicting the Sight and Sound nominees. Um, and I didn't, I mean, I didn't have time. Um, it's just life. And there were some other people on YouTube that actually did great jobs with that already. Um, but I did do a little Twitter thread. And so I'll just kind of go through them as real quick as like, this is the preamble to my looking at the list here. So just thoughts going into the list um, that happened today. And so if we go to my Twitter, these are just, you know, Twitter is in a hilarious state right now. Speaking of time capsuling, um, let's start here. So I just said here, um, this is actually a mock-up I made. Um, I'm, as you know, I'm a graphic designer. I actually was talking to the art directors at Sight & Sound 10 years ago about doing the cover on that issue. And it didn't work out because they wanted to do something different. But um, I have always fantasized about designing this cover. And so... My hope for the list is that my number one film of all time, Kubrick's 2001, would take first place. So it's it's been in every decade uh, prior or since it came out, essentially, and it's moved up the list a little bit each time. I think it placed out five or six in the last poll. Um, of course, Vertigo won 10 years ago. We'll talk about that. But 2001 has been like my hope that it would come to number one. Um, it's I mean, I don't know. What can I say about it? It's it's an example of a commercial film, but one that takes um, a transcendental approach to the experience of watching the film, um, almost a spiritual film, uh, if you, especially if you look at Kubrick's intentions or whatever. Um, but just my favorite. I would love to see it, number one. So I made, a, I made a cover that uses the amazing new branding that they have on Sight & Sound. I can't wait to get the print edition of this magazine. It'll probably be available for sale in a few days. Um, but I wanted to do, how can you do a cover, right? That kind of teases it. This is from the Stargate sequence, these colors inside. So I posted this um, and a couple of people thought it was real. Uh, so that was kind of funny for me to see. Um, but just thoughts here. Um, 
Yeah, just film culture over the last 10 years. Like, what is film culture? I mean, that's the big question everyone's been asking as we go to streaming and then as people are just obsessed with watching TV shows now. And most people I know not only don't read books much, but they don't watch films much anymore. The attention spans down. But it's still hanging on, right? You see films like Parasite, Moonlight, big, big movies that are also representing a different you know, perspective, uh, different stories, different perspective, different voices, which we need. Uh, more female directors, um, you know, After Sun, my favorite film of this year, Power of the Dog, can't be a winning best director. We have very few females in the top 100, if, if any, maybe there were a couple. <laughs> we need more. So that's the big question. Um, Vertigo is was a was a shocking upset you know 10 years ago not upset but one that hit number one no one was expecting citizen kane to be dethroned like that and vertigo is interesting because it's like a pulpier more entertainment type of movie hitchcock's known for that uh but it's also a psychological film even more than citizen kane probably it's a psychological film but it's a film about the male gaze and where we're at right now in culture i don't know how long it will be this way but there's a hypersensitivity around uh gender representation. I, I want to be careful what I say here because I'm not prepared to give a lecture on this. Um, but uh, Vertigo, it did not seem like it would be a film that would stay at number one to me for a second decade in a row. It's a nice twist that it happened. Uh, I love Vertigo. Uh, actually, one of my posters I designed for Vertigo, Kim Novak wrote me a card um, requesting a copy of it and wrote me a letter. It's one of my film poster stories. Um, <laughs> So, and it's amazing. Um, it's a great film, but it is about the male gaze. And it is from a male's perspective about being obsessed with a woman and being obsessed with a woman uh, to a point of, put it this way, it, it does not, we need those films because those are accurate, you know, representations of the male psychology throughout the, the throughout time. But it does not feel like the one that should be at the top of the list today. Now, is that to say that we should have like a woke list? No, not necessarily, but I'd like to see something, 2001 transcends all that stuff. That's why I, I like it as a number one. But anyway, I, I'm wondering if it could like clear and get number one today. Um, just saying like, depending on how many new, young, diverse voters, minority voters, uh, etc. You know, which they need to do. We need to make sure there is all of the equal voices as much as we can in, in this mix, right? Because we're doing this big poll. It's this big exercise. So could you see the list be completely upset? To take it to the extreme, I'm talking like Parasite at number one. Now, I know that sounds ridiculous because it is. It's it's credibly recent film. But when that film came out, people were already talking about Sight and Sound. I remember at the time. Um, so the recency bias taken to the greatest extreme. Now, Parasite is amazing for representation, Asian cinema, right? I love Asian cinema. I was so excited for Parasite, even though it wasn't even in my top 10. I liked Parasite fine, but it was not like my top 10. It was my number one, number one but I was obviously happy for it because it's a force for good, right? It's a great force for good to have Bong Joon-ho win that those multiple Oscars and whatever. But... Um, so I'm wondering, like, is it time for this kind of an upset? I put Daniel Day-Lewis, uh, Daniel Plainview here, um, just because there are some recent films um, that we, even if you don't take the extreme amount of, like, new upset type of placements in the list, like, there are still a lot of recent films that could get in there. Not as many as some people have predicted. I don't think there's going to be more than a handful in the top 100. Um, but Tree of Life, absolutely going to jump in there. Eyes Wide Shut, you know, Kubrick's my favorite. Eyes Wide Shut's my second favorite Kubrick. Uh, I think Eyes Wide Shut will place higher than anyone expected because it's been a lot of reappraisal on that one, just as you expect. We're like 20 years out from it. And this always happens with Kubrick's films. Um, so I'd love to see it place high. Tree of Life, I just mentioned maybe, or maybe I didn't. Uh, but Malik, I could see there, even though he's been ridiculed so much the last few films, at least until the most recent one. But um, I still think Tree of Life is going to have a good placement. Now, Spirited Away, um, obviously, you guys know I love, well, you don't you know, you're, you, you might be watching this, don't know me, but I love Miyazaki. I love Ghibli. I love animation in particular. And we'll get to my list in a second. 
if I was submitting one today. But Spirit Away, um, I, I went to I went to NYU Film School of Cinema Studies in 2001. So right when the new list was coming out in um, uh, 2002, and I remember my professor and we were talking about Spirit Away, and there were votes for Spirit Away in the last Sight and Sound poll, and it was discussed because it's very rare for a brand new film to have that kind of like greatest of all time. You think about it with these films, Tree of Life, There Will Be Blood. Spirit Away. Also think about Moonlight. I also think about Parasite. Um, I don't think Moonlight and Parasite are at the level of the others, but whatever. Um, but the, the the main thing here is that there has never been an animated film in the top 100. That is absolutely insane. Animation to me, well, not even to me, animation literally is cinema. It is frame by frame. That is that is the illusion of of life, the uh, the effect of cinema. It is animation itself, and I love animation in particular just because the beautiful humanistic craft behind it, right? And and also this is Asian cinema. Uh, if we have Spirited Away in there, and Totoro is my favorite. Uh, I put Totoro on my list, but I would love to see Spirited Away, Grave of the Fireflies. I showed here. There's others. I mean, I think Disney's Fantasia uh, should be in the top 100 as well. Fantasia, not only just for the hand-drawn animation and what it did at the time, but it is basically an avant-garde film. And I think that in the true trajectories of, of filmmaking, and this is what I really took away from Cinema Studies program at NYU, there is the commercial film track and there, there is the non-commercial, the experimental or avant-garde. Um, and it we think of movies as the commercial movies and really originally a lot of them were more avant-garde and we have drifted away from that track so fantasia just these like dialogue free sequences set to classical music recontextualizing music and i i just think it's a it's an absolutely groundbreaking film that still nothing has ever really rivaled so fantasia would almost be on my list i digress uh mulholland drive Lynch is, you know, one of the goats um, as he's basically been in a retirement. He had Twin Peaks The Return, which everyone, people even talked about The Return being on the sight and sound list. Um, <laughs> it made top 10 lists that year, even though it wasn't a film. Um, but Mulholland Drive definitely like only getting bigger in retrospect. This is definitely a big one that's going to place high. In the Move for Love is going to place super high. It did last time already. It was brand new. Um, Close up, uh, definitely Kiarostami has to be in there. Um, I think he's gonna do well. Yee Yee, Briar Summer's Day, Edward Yang, both gonna do well. Um, I don't know what to make of the whole new Hollywood um, group. So Spielberg, Coppola, Scorsese, this would include Taxi Driver, Apocalypse Now, The Godfather, Jaws, um, all of these. I'm not sure how they're all gonna do. To me, this is just my personal opinion, they're feeling irrelevant. Um, that's just me. Now, The Godfather, obviously, it's one of the great films of all time. You're going to see it in there. Um, you're going to see all of those in there, probably. Hell, I have Star Wars on my uh, sight and sound list. So, um, But what I'm saying here is just, uh, what about the Tokyo stories, the rules of the games? Um, can we just abandon them? As, as the decades go on, you know, you have more films that are going to be brought in, not just from new films that are made, but we're increasing our depth of understanding of what film has been and trying to include all kinds of voices, not just, you know, white male directors. But at the same time, Godard, right? <laughs> Jean Renoir, Eisenstein, Jean Vigo. It's hard to think about just abandoning them. Um, so that's complicated, and I, I, I'm not the person to, to have a lecture on it right now. I just wonder what's going to happen. I really do. Rules of the Game has been a perennial, and but it's not one that you ever hear any people talk about the last 10 years, especially young people. So I have no idea there. Um, I'm curious to see. Battleship Potemkin, Eisenstein, I mean, just for the editing alone. Um, a lot of these early cinema pioneers that um, kind of created the montage techniques we know of now. I have one on my list that I'll talk about that I hope will still place high. But then Tokyo Story, Ozu appreciation has definitely grown. I myself am even behind on my Ozu appreciation. I'm looking forward to more. I think Ozu will do very well as he always has. Um, some people even think Tokyo Story is going to take number one. 
Um, down here we have Varda, so women. You can't have five of the 10 and be female. It's just not, there's no logistical way that's going to happen right now. The only logistical way you would have equal female to men, uh, as, as amazing as that would be, um, is if you, I don't know, you selected only, I guess, people who would vote women or, or women voters and they made like nine out of their 10 films be female directors we have to accept that we're on a trajectory and, and we're, we're not, again, so many of the most influential films were created under a patriarchal system. We can't undo that history. We can look at other histories, but we can't undo the influence of, of them. So it's really, it's, it's a shame, it's problematic, and it's, it sucks in a lot of ways, but it's just where we're at. Um, but Agnes Varda, it's kind of like all on Agnes Varda and uh, Chantal Ackerman and a few people like this. You know, I think Jane Campion will have a high placement probably somewhere with piano. Hell, maybe even Power of the Dog. I have no idea. Um, but Agnes Varda is great because she has the documentary side too. And we love Varda. Uh, Gleaners and I was one of the ones that was on the Sight and Sound somewhere. Um, and that's how I discovered Varda is through the Gleaners and I. And the Gleaners and I is going to be on my list as well. Um, so documentary is also very underrepresented. So having a Varda doc would be beautiful. And then Shoah to me, um, another film I had the totally fringe, but important and meaningful honor of working on the Criterion package for Shoah is on my list. It is the greatest documentary ever made to me, documentary project. Um, I think it should and will hopefully place high. We'll see. Um, but yeah, a sea change of representation. Um, we can have both. I, I, I want a perfect marriage. I want a perfect marriage of the classic canon and and new a new canon. You know, I want them to, to coexist. My list as of yesterday was in this is in alphabetical order. 2001: Space Odyssey. Although that would be my number one. Close up because you have to have Kiristami and it's very meta and yeah. Daisies is one of my two female filmmakers that I made sure to include. It's also an avant-garde film, and it's a completely subversive uh, film that represents upending the patriarchy in a way that I love. It's also a visually, the, the, the language of film here is on display in the most amazing candy-coated way. Uh, Gleaners and I, Varda. Man with a Movie Camera is my early cinema pick. To me, like, I have to be able to take any film that we talk about being in the canon and I have to be able to trace it back to one of my films on my sight and sound list. All of the silent era, to me, you can go back to Man with the Movie Camera. It's also a documentary. It is a non-narrative film. It is a portrait of a city. Um, it uses every trick in the book in 1929. It is absolutely a phantasmagoria. I don't know if that's a good word. It's a kaleidoscope. Um, it's not a phantasmagoria. It's a kaleidoscope, though. <laughs> so I'm breaking out all my big words for this one. I haven't talked about movies with anyone in, the, in a minute uh, post-pandemic. But Man with the Movie Camera, it's probably, I would say, number two to me after 2001. I really hope it still stays in the top ten. I really, really hope it does. There has been talk about this movie. There have been screenings. It's still kind of in the conversation. I try to recommend it to people. We'll see. Totoro is my animated pick. Ghibli is in. Miyazaki is, to me, my second favorite director. I went... This is my, like, gut heart pick, but I did uh, Sachi Jirai's Panther Panchali. Apu Trilogy is, like, my biggest discovery the last 10 years, along with this one, which is Bergman, The Silence. Uh, when I saw Bergman, The Silence, I was just blown away. Shout out to Allison Inman for connecting that movie for me and holy cow like i immediately thought of david lynch because everything you love about lynch came from this movie i'm telling you guys um and so again instead of having lynch in i have the silence in because to me it's like the original lynch and it was also very kubrickian to me and i did some research and found out that kubrick had in fact listed it as one of his favorite films of all time star wars i put in for the popular escapist movie. I mean, we have zillions of these and um, there's a romance there that needs to be honored. So I wanted to put it on my list. Oh my gosh. We're almost there. And just cutting room floor for me, Jean Dielman, Quina Scotzi. Quina Scotzi was in my tin. I took it off for daisies. Um, 
I took it off because it, that in 2001 kind of exists in the same area. I want different types of, of film experiences to be represented if I were to be sending in a list. And I'm not. This is just for fun. Uh, Mirror Tarkovsky. It's it's crazy that Tarkovsky is not in my top 10. Um, Fantasia, like I discussed. Modern Times. I think Chaplin's going to do really well. Um, House, yes, House. I know that it's just that crazy Japanese movie that I did the poster for, but having been so intimately involved with House, meeting Obayashi and like really like appreciating that movie so many times as I watched it, like I truly grew to believe it is one of the greatest films I've ever seen. And it's Asian cinema. I don't have any Asian cinema on here. I have Satyajit Ray, but I don't have any Japanese or, which is crazy because Tokyo Story should also be in here. Even though I don't, I don't know if I get Tokyo Story quite as much as everyone else, I'll, I'll be honest, but again, my Ozu appreciation is still growing and I do think it deserves to be in there. Citizen Kane, I also think it deserves to still be on the top 10. So hopefully no one just forgot about Citizen Kane because if, if literally no one voted for Citizen Kane because everyone's going in these other directions, then oh my gosh, we could have it off the top 10. That would be weird. Uh, La Ventura is my Antonioni and yeah, I still see it as a mystery. Um, okay, well, it's obviously a mystery, but there's a lot going on in there about... I'm very interested in the transition from the patriarchal era to a new era and how films deal with that. This film actually deals with that, but it's 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 from the European... It represents the European new wave, and Antonioni has got a lot going on in terms of film art that needs to be represented in here somewhere and he will be represented trist is nathaniel dorsky's short film this is the my most obscure pick it is a short film by dorsky i saw it at nyu it was the most beautiful thing i'd ever seen i've only seen it one time because it's only available on 16 millimeter um and i hope to see it again but it's it's there for me um i think it's time to look at the list um but i'll before we do, I'll, I now gave you guys the teaser, and I will say um, that I was texting this morning in the hour or so leading up to this, and the suspension, the suspense is mounting. Um, this image of Mulholland Drive is ringing in my mind. I'm texting with Adrian Curry, who is my art director from uh, Zeitgeist, and Kino and a, a author of movie poster of the day one of my good friends in the movie poster world and he's an amazing curator and writer for film comments and we were texting about i see i want to make sure okay um we were texting about what's a film that could upset everything you know and um just getting excited about a no guts no glory pick um here i'm talking more about 2001 but um, I posted this Lynch quote, no matter what the weather is, I wish for all of you blue skies and golden sunshine internally all along the way. Cause I was like, is Mulholland Drive about to beat the list? Five minutes before the list is supposed to drop, I text Adrian and, and I'm saying, okay, what's your final no gust no glory? And he's, he goes Mulholland Drive and I say, okay, John Dealman. So I thought I had this realization like, let's say you added 500 female film critics okay and hopefully they did or you added 500 film 500 critics who are going to make sure female film female directed films are on their lists in large amounts or in, in strong amounts i don't see any of them not putting jean dealman on the list or maybe another claire ackerman chantal ackerman S sorry I, I knew a girl named Claire Ackerman in high school. Um, it's hard for me to see them not putting Jean Dielman on. And that just made sense to me. And so five minutes before the list, I post this tweet. Final No Guts, No Glory before going off the Twitter grid. And I do this Jean Dielman gif. Then I'm about to log off. It's not even the stroke of the top of the hour yet. And I start seeing two other John Dealman tweets. And I, what I said at the time was, did Nostra Gamgee just strike again? Nostra Gamgee is what my college friends called me in college because I love predicting the Oscars and predicting things. And I'm damn good at it. 
if I don't say so myself. And if I just called at the last second that John Dealman would top the list, I guess I'm just going to have to start a YouTube channel called Nostragamji or something. I've got six notifications. Let's go to the list. Um, let's go to the list. Let's see how they do it too. And by the way, just final thoughts. Um, I want to get this print issue. I hope they do some awesome articles in there about, you know, uh, Asian cinema being represented or silent film and, and how that canon has shifted, how the canon of male and female directors has evolved. I want to see some great articles from BFI there. Um, there are going to be a lot of hot takes today on Twitter and like all kinds of takes. I just hope it's not Parasite at number one. That would be a little bit um, extreme. So here we go, bfi.org. I think that's the website. Ah, it's not bfi.org. Shout out to Buck, Buckminster Fuller Institute, bfi.com.co. Let's just Google BFI. Okay, BFI. Okay. <laughs> John Dillman is already shown in the header, but then this is sight and sound the greatest films of all time. Citizen Kane. What is about to happen? What is about to happen? Would I be happy if Citizen... Okay, final thoughts was, yes, John Dillman, number one, was my no best on glory. Five minutes before. <laughs> Citizen Kane returning to number one, I'd be totally fine with. And um, 2001 is my hope. Here we go. In 1952, the team had the novel idea of asking critics to name the greatest films. The tradition became decennial, increasing in size and prestige. Now a major belt. Oh my God, Get Out is already there. This is amazing. Um, holy shit. Wow, Get Out in the top 100. Oh my God. Mm, so wild. This is fun. This is going to be fun. Um, oh man, there are going to be a lot of films that leave the canon this year today. Goodbye, Greed. Goodbye, Laudalant. <laughs> oh, gosh. This is going to be interesting. Okay. The Science Out Poll is now a major bellwether of critical opinion on cinema. This year's edition is the largest ever with 1,639 participating critics, programmers, curators, archivists, and academics. Maybe me one day, guys. Um, submitting their top 10 ballot. Who has risen in the ranks? Who has fallen? Has 2012's winner Vertigo held onto his title? Find out below. So we have um, stream the greatest films of all time. I don't know what that means. What is that? Is that like a video of this? I, if so, I, I wish I could have seen that, but I don't think so. Dre we have the director's list as well. All right, so I'm gonna bump this up. Jean Dielman is straight up shown on the header. Okay, 95, get out. The general hanging onto the list, black girl, Amazing to see that rising up. Tropical Malady, yes, Joe is in the top 100 again. I don't remember where he placed before. I hope to see two or three Abby Champong Where of Seth the Cool films. Um, yeah, Uncle Boon Me, maybe. Um, Once Upon a Time in the West. Okay, so we have some classic canon there still. A Man Escaped, Bresson showing up already in 95. I hope he has three or four in here. Balthazar probably high. Madame Day made it. The Leopard made it. Ugetsu. Okay, classic canon. This is like some Criterion Essential Art House action. That's good to see. Good to see. Good to see. And this is going to be so fun to see who voted for what. Like if we click on Get Out, do we get to see who voted for it? Huh. Huh. We don't right here, but there's got to be a way. There's got to be a way. I really look forward to seeing who voted for what. Okay, Yee Yee is at 90. Okay, I thought it'd be higher. Parasite made the top 100 over Yee Yee. That is, oh, I don't know about that. That is in Chunking Express. Look at that trifecta. Oh my God, Yee Yee, Parasite, and Chunking trifecta. And the move for love is going to do well. But Parasite made the top 100. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Crazy. Yee Yee is lower than I thought. It really fell, I think. I think it fell. I, I have to look at last. You know, I'm going to pull up last year's results because I want to have a comparison. Um, okay, Sight and Sound 2012. Just from last, last uh, you know, 10 years ago. Uh, where are we? We are. No, I want to go to 2012. 
Hello. Um. Here we go. Critics top 100. Okay, yeah, like, let's just, I want to search for a couple things as we go. Yee Yee. Can we find it? Did it make the list? Maybe Yee Yee didn't. Wow. Yang? Oh, well, it's, it's listed as a one and a two, which is the alternate title. So it was 93 then, it's 90 now. Okay, so right around the same zone. There's some ties and stuff. Parasite, wow. Did Chunking Express make it? I'm gonna be doing a lot of this, okay? Um, just hang on. Chunking did not, so that's huge. Chunking got Chunking got in. That's amazing. Wong Kar Wai. The Shining. Oh my gosh. The, the Shining. Okay, so Kubrick. Oh my. Uh, that is very cool because it... Oh my gosh. Because it suggests... I, I think it's one of the younger voters would do. I mean, this was my first Kubrick I saw... I love it. I think Shining is a masterpiece. It's amazing to see a horror film in the top 100 too. People are going to be hyped about that. Uh, we got two Godards in a row. Um, Godard last decade. Now he he passed away before votes were, sorry, after votes were submitted. So Godard had Breathless at 13. He had Contempt at 21. Um, Pro Lefou at 43, so this one's fallen. History, History of Cinema at 48, so these have both fallen, okay? But I wouldn't be surprised if the other two rows. Just saying. Spear of the Beehive, Blue Velvet, and Selene and Julie. Okay, these are all classic film canon picks. I mean, Spear of the Beehive, I'm actually surprised stayed in the uh, 100. Um, I don't think it was in there before. Oh, no, it was, 81. Okay, so again, same zone. Blue Velvet may have fallen um, from 69. Yeah, it fell a little bit, but don't worry. Lynch is going to be fine. Now, Jacques Rivette, Celine and Ju Julie Gobelli, and this is one of the really highbrow ones. I love slow... Uh, I mean, you guys know. I, I have a lot of slow films. I always say you guys know, but no one knows me who's watching this unless you do. But I love slow art house films um, and weird, weird, weird esoteric highbrow films. But... Celine Joe Bo Julie, I didn't get yet. Uh, I'll, I'll go back to it. I'm actually surprised that one made it a little bit. That just shows the artsy nature of this list. I love it. A Matter of Life and Death, Modern Times, and A Briar Summer Day. There is Yang. He was not as high as I thought with Briar Summer Day. But he's in there with both. Modern Times, yes. Shout out to one of my Criterion projects. Um, and I love that film. It's on my... Second 10 that I had there for my list. A Matter of Life and Death. Powell and Pressburger hanging on. I did not expect Powell and Pressburger to do as well this time. That is crazy. Okay. Sate and Tango. Uh, Satan Tango. Sunset Boulevard and Sancho. Wow. Mitsugushi. Wow. Sunset Boulevard, Old Hollywood coming in, and Satan Tango, Balatar. These are awesome picks. This is awesome so far. I'm loving how this is all going. <laughs> Spirit Away and Totoro back to back. Oh my God, yes. Two films in the top 100. My man, Miyazaki. Oh, the greatest. The greatest. Do not ever leave us, Miyazaki-san. Oh my God, that's awesome. I mean, I would have loved to see either of them higher, but just that they're both on the top 100 is wonderful. Oh my God, I can breathe. I can breathe. That's so cool seeing them together. Imitation of Life, okay. Figured that would still still, still be well, well considered. Journey to Italy, La Ventura is at 72. Okay, this is one of my predicted 10, so this really fell a lot more than I thought. Yikes. That is surprising. That's probably my biggest surprise so far. Is Laventura replacing that low? Metropolis, yep. Glad to see. I'm not worried. I'm not worried anymore about Rules of the Game, Tokyo Story, Battleship Potemkin, Man with a Movie Camera, any of those. I'm not worried about them based on how this is going. Um, Journey to Italy, even. That's a surprise to see in here. There's a lot of old, black and white, foreign, classic film canon stuff in here. That is, is kind of reassuring to see, honestly. The Gleaners and I. Oh, Varda at 67. 
I thought this would be higher. I hope this isn't her highest. She didn't even place last time? Oh, <gasps> she didn't even place last time. Okay, well, I'll take it then. Oh my God, Agnes. We love you. We miss you. Oh my God. The red shoes, Powell and Pressburg again. I figured that would be in the 100. La Jete stays strong. Chris Marker, hype. Let's go. That's awesome. That's a, this is the short film uh, 12 Monkeys was based on. It's it's a there's it's almost all still images and it's a short feature film. Uh, some people were wondering if this would make the top 10 or not, and it did. What's the next trilogy? Andre Rublev at 67. Tuki Buki beating Andre Rublev. Holy crap. Tuki Buki. Um, okay, so do you know African cinema? Okay, if not, Tuki Buki. Um, yes. Hell yes. Amazing selection. Um, that's one that I got turned on to through recent Cannes Film Festival projects. Um, wow. That is awesome. Um, Maddie Diop, who directed Atlantics, is a granddaughter of, of this director. Um, sorry, don't quote me on that. Family member of this director. So we, we revisited Tukibuki. Oh my gosh. But the fact that Andrei Rublev is only 67, I mean, I really want to see what, what, I want to see what happens with Tarkovsky. I think Solaris could be on the top 100 and Stalker and Mirror. I think Mirror will probably be the highest Tarkovsky. Casablanca is in the top 100. That's just, man, they're just like, we believe in old classic Hollywood cinema still. That is, I'm a little surprised Casablanca's on the list. I think that means that I think it means that a lot of the old Hollywood Godfather, all that stuff is going to do really well too. Third Man, Goodfellas, Daughters of the Dust. This is this is all going so well. This is just like everything is here. Everyone is here. This is the Super Smash Brothers of, of movies. Third Man is Carol Reed, Orson Welles acting uh, turn there. Um Goodfellas, Scorsese's in, Daughters of the Dust, Julie Dash. This is one of those female filmmakers we really hoped would make the 100, and it definitely did. No problem there, number 60. Moonlight at number 60, holy cow! That is the second biggest surprise. Oh my gosh, wow. Bravo, Barry Jenkins. Holy shit. Damn, the power of Moonlight. That's beautiful. That is beautiful. That is beautiful. Uh, fun fact, I saw Moonlight for the first and only time the very morning Trump was inaugurated as president. Or the moment he won the presidency. So the, the day after election night, right? Wake up, Trump has been declared the winner. I leave the house and I walk into a dark theater and I see Moonlight. Absolutely one of the most unforgettable film experiences I've ever had in a theater. La Dolce Vida, I'm... It shouldn't be at 60. It shouldn't be higher than some of these others. It shouldn't... I'm sorry. I'm sorry it shouldn't. My opinion, Fellini, I like him a lot. Um, but this just seems like an old pick compared to, like, over Moonlight, over Miyazaki. Come on. Come on. Come on. And if that's the highest animated film, it probably is. I would love to see Fantasia on this list, though. Sans Soleil, Chris Marker's other uh, most notable film, in addition to La Jete. So La Jete is here at 67. Sans Soleil is at 59. We got three more black and whites coming up. Sherlock Jr., Apartment, and Battleship Potemkin. Okay, all three old school. Wow, Apartment. Where are the Apartment place last time? Because Billy Wilder had, has, of course, Sunset Boulevard possibly in the mix here. Um, but, uh, guys, I'm not a film expert, okay? I do my best. Uh, this I hope you're finding this entertaining. <sighs> the apartment didn't place in the top 100. I'm surprised that of all decades, that between 2012 and 2022, the apartment appeared in the top 100. That is just shocking to me. Um, it just doesn't seem like one that would rise in the last 10 years. There's a lot of old Hollywood love in here. Maybe they reached out to a bunch of old white men and got their ballots added too. <laughs> Battleship Potemkin is great to see here just because Eisenstein did so much for the film form and he actually wrote about 
the film form and editing. If you study editing and stuff in, in cinema studies, you're reading Eisenstein's texts. So like Godard and others, he was one of those film theorists, film writers who was also a filmmaker. Great stuff. Blade Runner. News from Home. Ackerman's News from Home made 52. That is... Yo, did I call the number one film, guys? Contempt from Godard and Blade Runner. I had a feeling Blade Runner would do really well. Uh, I'm pretty sure not on... Oh, no, it's number 69. Okay. For some reason, I thought it wasn't on the last top 100. I'm kind of surprised at both. Uh, but, yeah. Contempt, um, where, would it, where did it place? Let's see if it rose or fall. It was 21, so it's fallen a little bit. That's that's to be understandable. I mean, that's to be expected. Uh, Breathless, I think, is still going to place really high. So News From Home is a crazy addition. Actually, I actually haven't seen Ackerman's News From Home, so I'm excited to watch that one now. That's maybe the first film in the list I have not seen. Um, there was maybe one more. I haven't seen it. I haven't seen Journey to Italy, so I haven't seen Sancho the Bailiff. So those two I haven't seen. I haven't seen A Matter of Life and Death. Okay. Um, so just to be clear, those are the ones. Oh, haven't seen. Okay, there's more. Haven't seen The Leopard. Haven't seen Madame Day. Or The Earrings of Madame Day, as it's also known. So need to catch up with those. Um, back to where we were. Battleship and Newsroom Home. The next three are Furious the Soul. Yes. Oh, dude. I don't even know hardly anything about Fassbender. I have not seen a lot of his films. This side of World on the Wire. But... Furious the Soul, I watched for another project. Actually, a, a project with BFI. I did the BFI book cover uh, for Furious the Soul, the modern classics. Uh, so shout out to you, BFI, uh, for our, our other collab. But this movie is phenomenal. It is so good. I absolutely expected to see it do really well. Where did it place last time? Fear. Oh, that's... <laughs> 93 okay so it's risen and it absolutely deserves that the piano campion i told you guys campion would appear with piano i'm pretty sure it was not even on the top 100 last time so epic placement from campion 400 blows trafo yep boom top 50 great wanda wow i haven't seen it yet i know this one i mean if you're talking about like a new feminist or female director canon you know like wanda is going to be one of the ones you hear about, and Janice released it. It's on Criterion Channel right now. That's one to absolutely revisit as soon as you can after this list, or, or check out, like I will be doing. That is amazing. So Barbara Loden, we got some females being represented. This is what I really needed to see here. Ordet, Orday, Ordet. Um, expected that in the top 50, and North by Northwest, really? I'm still surprised North by Northwest is the Hitchcock I don't know. I was never impressed with that one as much as the the more psychological Hitchcocks. Um, you know, your rear window, um, obviously Psycho, and obviously Vertigo, but even stuff like there's even others I would pick over North by Northwest. I'm, I'm surprised it's done so well, honestly. I don't really see a lot of the deeper levels on this one. It's a great film. Uh, don't get me wrong. I've studied it a lot, but I don't know. I don't see this top 50. Interesting. What do you guys think? Leave a comment. Smash the like button. Battle of Algiers, Barry Lyndon, and Killer of Sheep. Wow. Killer of Sheep is awesome to see on this list. Um, again, talk about representation. That is needed to be there. Barry Lyndon did well. Um, I love I love Barry Lyndon. Kubrick's my favorite. Um, where did it place last time? 59. So it's about in the same zone. It's risen a little bit. Kubrick. I, okay, I'm curious if Eyes Wide Shut is in the top 40. I'm a little getting worried that it's not. I'm a little getting worried that it's not, but if I'm being honest with you, it, it is going to be in the top 40. Eyes wide shut. Battle of Algiers, holding strong there. This is another classic film canon pick. Um, it was 48 last year. It's 45 this year, so right around the same spot. Stalker, Rashomon, Bicycle Thieves. Why did they do a black and white shot from Stalker? Or is that just how desaturated that shot is? I thought it was more green. So great to see Tarkovsky there. Stalker, it was on my top 10 sight and sound. I just removed it just because it's too similar to some of the other experiences that you get from my films on that on my list. Rashomon and Bicycle Thieves are absolutely locks for this list already. Bicycle Thieves, 
started out the first decade or two like at the top of the sight and sound list. So this one has a lot of prestige and legacy behind it on this list. Rashomon, Kurosawa doing really well as predicted. We're still gonna see Seven Samurai ahead of us here. We might even see Kagamusha, Ron, um, others on those on this list as we go forward. Rear window, some like it hot. Breathless is at 38. Okay, we're getting into the we're getting high up here, guys. Uh, some like it hot again. The classic Hollywood with Billy Wilder. Um, I forgot to mention this one when we talked about Wilder a minute ago, but I'm s surprised it's this high. That that's cool to see. This is. I like that the entire top 100 is not being completely rocked and exploded into smithereens. Rear window, yep. Yep, again, we just talked about Hitchcock and those. Breathless at 38. I think that might be where Godard taps out. Um, yeah, it was 13. Fell from 13 to 38. I mean, rest in peace. We, are, we have already these four. Already all four of these have been shown. Contempt, Perot. History to Cinema and Breathless. They're done. That's it. Unless they throw in two or three things I know about her, which is to me maybe his best film. But I don't see that coming out of nowhere. We'll see. I need Eyes Wide Shut to happen soon, guys. Father Banjali, yes. Oh my God, at 35, yes, dude. Oh my God. This is one of the most beautiful discoveries. Um, just like. You know, you're a film fan and you think you've seen most of the big things and there are certain directors you hear about that you've always wanted to get into. Like, still for me, Ozu is a big thing I've been saving, right? And Sajid Ray, um, filmmaker from India who directed, did the posters of his films, did some of the music, but Ravi Shankar did this music. Okay, long story short, this was very hyped up, the Apu trilogy, right? And boy, did it live up and beyond. I, I just, this is the first film of the three. Um, it's my favorite of the three. It's on my sight and sound list. What a pick. What a pick. M and City Lights are perennial sight and sound movies. It's awesome to see there. City Lights, this might be the top Chaplin. Might be the, this might be where Chaplin taps out. It went from 50 up here, but we have... <sighs> we already have Modern Times. We got City Lights. We still could see like The Great Dictator have a crazy high placement, possibly. Given its political um, message, M is awesome to see. It's a masterpiece by Fritz Long. Lotte Lante made it in. Wow. Okay. How many young millennial or Gen Z film fans have you heard talk about Lotte Lante? Because I haven't heard a single one. The fact that this is on the list says a lot about the strength of the existing canon and the influence of it. Uh, for better or worse, it does. And I haven't seen this film. I know I've looked at some other YouTubers who've talked about this and have said something similar. And there's always comments saying, you have to see La La Land. It's so underappreciated. So obviously I don't know anything about this film really. Um, it's always been on the sight and sound list. This is maybe lower than it's been in a while. Um, so it did fall, I think. Let's see if I can just do Vigo. Yeah, I mean, it was 12 in 2012. It was number 12 in 2012. And just to refresh here, some of the big ones that are still to come potentially, obviously Vertigo, Susan Kane, Tokyo Story, Rules of the Game. I think those are all good. I think Sunrise is good. I think these are all gonna be there. The Searchers, a lot of people are predicting this one to fall, but the way it's going with a lot of like traditional old Hollywood movies still being in there, I could see it still being to come. I wouldn't mind if it fell off the list. That's just me. Um, Passion of Joan of Arc is definitely still to come. Eight and a Half is still to come. Potemkin. Apocalypse Now. We have a couple more. Ozu's, Bresson, Seven Samurai, Persona, Singing in the Rain, Godfather. In the Mood for Love is still to come. Mulholland Drive is still to come. Showa, please say Showa is still to come. Taxi Driver, Godfather 2 is still to come. Psycho is just called out. Um, and then we're getting into, there's, there's John Dealman at 36. Oh boy, oh boy. Um, then it's a lot of things we've already seen. Close Up could be ascending, just as I thought Playtime could be ascending. Haven't mentioned Tati yet. Uh, oh wow, Gertrude by Dryer. That might fall off the list. That one might fall off the list. It would be a steep, a long fall too, because look, all of these are in there. Raging Bull maybe fell, we don't know. Touch of Evil, 
we haven't seen yet. We haven't seen Touch of Evil yet. Okay, Wild Strawberries we haven't seen yet. Sunset Boulevard, Night of the Hunter, Pickpocket. Guys, these can't all make it in. There are going to be some that are left out, and I'm already going to say right here that the ones that are left out, we have to think of them kind of as flukes because it, I don't think there's a lot of rhyme or reason to... I think a lot of those are going to be in the, the 100 to 150. It's just going to be a lot of shuffling around in that top tier. So I wouldn't go ahead. I wouldn't go on and like have your hot takes about X or Y film is, is done. Uh, Mirror is Tarkovsky, as we said. Probably the highest... Wow, I thought that'd be the highest Tarkovsky. But we could have Solaris still to come. Stalker's done. Maybe Solaris didn't make the 100. I could see Solaris not making the 100. And that's fair. We have Mirror, Stalker, Andre Rublev. I can I can be good with that, for sure. Psycho placed higher than I thought. Um, let's move on. Oh my God, Portrait of a Lady at 30? I already saw Showa underneath. What? Portrait of a Lady at 30? Are you freaking kidding me? Celine Siama, director of my number one of last year, Petit Mama. Shout out. Wow. Wow. I am shook. That is amazing. Because when you think of the recent films, Moonlight, Portrait of a Lady, I think of Roma, but Roma's not, I don't think I'm gonna make this list. I did not think Portrait of a Lady would be the one that would place the highest of all of the recent films, Parasite. Holy cow, that is epic. That is so huge. That is so huge. So huge. Celine Siama's having a good day. In between Taxi Driver and Eight and a Half, look at these two masculine movies right here. And then Portrait of a Lady on Fire. Boom. Showa is in the next list. Daisies in my top 10. Yes. Daisies. We are getting some, we are getting the representationally, representational shift that I think everyone, everyone hoped to see. So that's awesome. Showa, Night of the Hunter. Honestly, Showa should be higher. Showa should be top 10. I'm saying it. It should be top 10. This is probably the highest documentary if you don't count Man with the Movie Camera. Where's Eyes Wide Shut, dude? I am scared that Eyes Wide Shut got left off the list. Maybe it did. I, see, I would never guess The Shining would make it over Eyes Wide Shut. I really wouldn't. Night the Hunter. Daisies, that is amazing to see Daisies at 28. Next, give me Eyes Wide Shut. Do the right thing, yes. Balthazar, Bresson, okay. Knew that was gonna be in the, in the tops. Playtime, knew those being the top, awesome. I think both um, improved. Oh, well, Balthazar, yeah, Balthazar fell. That's too bad, but it didn't fall that, fall that much. It's just because other films have been bumped up, I think. Um, Bresson was at 16 with Balthazar, and now it's at 25, fine. Playtime, 43. Playtime grew as it should. Masterpiece. Do the right thing, though, I don't think was even on the list. Um, yeah, that is huge. That's the biggest new placement is do the right thing so far. Biggest new placement. Biggest debut on the on the top 100. All right, what's next? We have Late Spring, Passion of Joan of Arc, Seven Samurai. These are all top 20 from 10 years ago, okay? All holding their place. Ozu, Tokyo Story will still be coming. Seven Samurai, I thought it might almost get into top 10 but that was when i was thinking we might have like an imdb type of top 10 this year with like you know uh pulp fiction and seven samurai and who knows what else seven samurai amazing deserves to be in the top 20 passion of joan of arc i actually thought it would place higher i thought it would be maybe top 10 um that's the biggest silent film so far what's next top 20 you guys top 20 Apocalypse Now, Persona, and Close Up. Close Up. <laughs> so good. Close Up in the top 20. That is just like, oh, I cannot tell you guys. And you, if you're a lover of film like me and you know these films, like this feels so good to, 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 to know that Kiristami is in the top 20 films of all time. Fuck yes. Guys, Kiristami is the most recent discovery for me of all the, the greats. And shout out to Richard Vance. Well, shout out to Richie and Millennial. Oh my God. And Persona. Absolutely. Yes. Bergman. Look, Persona is like a, 
it's got like maybe a touch of the cliche art film reputation it lives up to it just trust me it lives up to it you could watch this film a hundred times and have more and more layers about what it's saying about i'm just gonna say it about femininity and 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 the female myth it's it's directed by a man, but as you guys know, his relationships with these women were incredibly intimate. And there's some really, really uh, deep stuff going on in that movie. That is, and it's a visual feast as well. Apocalypse Now. Sorry guys, I'm out of practice about talking about films. I don't know if Eyes Wide Shut's gonna make this top 16. Um, the remaining ones, once again, we still, Vertigo, Susan Kane, Tokyo Story, Rules the Game, Sunrise, 2001, Surger's Man. Eight and a half. There's room for a couple, a couple surprises here. Meshes of the afternoon at 16 and Cleo at 14. Varda at 14. Agnes. Agnes, you're looking down on us and you are smiling. And I did not expect that. This is her first, her first film, if I'm not mistaken. And by the way, if you ever thought the Futura font was attributed to Wes Anderson, no, he got it from Cleo from five to seven. Wow. And meshes of the afternoon. So there's a huge, I, I don't want to keep saying feminist because it's, it's more complicated than just feminist. But when you talk about feminism and film, Maya Darren is like the number one. She and... Uh, I would say Ackerman are like the two you you study first, you you discover first. This is a short film of sorts. It's not a feature length film. So I'm at, this is one of the biggest surprises of the list. Clear from five to seven is one of the biggest of the list. And the searchers is just sitting in here, this old fart of a movie. I'm sorry, but that no offense to Spielberg and anyone else out there, but this does not belong here. One of these things is not like the others. But hey, I, this, I guess this says it all, right? Uh, an old Hollywood, traditional male Western, uh, classic male Western, um, which is well-made and everything. It, it's, it's great, it's fine, but sandwiched in between these two really progressive picks, that's amazing. Okay, here's where shit gets real. Rules of the Game falls to 13, Godfather in 12, and Sunrise at 11. Sunrise and Rules the Game dropping out of the top 10 for the first time in so long. These are staples of the top 10. I, and again, I could be making some little mistakes here, so don't eat me up. But Godfather is at 21 before and it's at 12 now. Wow, where is Taxi Driver and Apocalypse now? Are Taxi Driver and Apocalypse now both gonna be in the top 10? It's also, can I just be real here for a second? I know that Star Wars has been like completely bastardized at this point, but why isn't the original Star Wars in the top 100 at least? If you have like the Searchers in 15. Star Wars, I mean, it doesn't it deserve a little bit of something there? I don't know. I can't go on and on about that. The top 10 is here. I have to cover the others. I have to like do this on my screen. I'm gonna do this one at a time. Okay, and number 10, Singing in the Rain. Wow, holding strong. Okay, it was one of the remaining ones. I'm not surprised to see it still there. Representing the classic Hollywood musical, boom. This is like, so far the top 10 is intact. I mean, it's not one-to-one -one intact, but it, it represents the history of the sight and sound list still. Number nine, Man with a Movie Camera. Wow, I'm glad it made the top 10, but this should be top five to me. I'm so glad it's still in the top 10. Woo, woo, rules the game is out. Keep that in mind. What is the next one? Mulholland freaking drive at number eight. That means in the mood for love is going to be higher than Mulholland drive. Oh my God, Lynch. Oh my God, Lynch in the top 10. This is so good, man. Lynch, oh my God. That is incredible. All right, I gotta keep going. This is, I'm just like riding this roller coaster. Number seven. Bo Travai? What? In the top 10? Are you kidding me? Claire Denis? 
Oh my god. I mean, I thought this movie would do well, but number seven? Holy living shit. Oh my god. 2001 at number six? No! I wanted it to be top five. It never has gotten in the top five. And in the mood for love in five. Oh. Oh my god. I am like hyperventilating here. Oh my god. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. It beat in the it beat in the Holland Drive. It beat 2001. I don't know if I can condone that. <sighs> Bo Travai is just completely the biggest surprise on this entire ranking so far for how high it placed. What is number four? Give it to me now. Tokyo Story at number four. Citizen Kane number three. Ver John Dick! <laughs> I I called the I called it I, I I'm I I don't want to be that guy but I literally <laughs> tweeted this five minutes before the results what the heck just happened I I am literally speechless there okay in my mind there's the fact that I predicted this five minutes before the results three minutes before the results literally on Twitter. And then there's the fact that John Dillman is number one. Just the film itself. Both things are amazing. So forget about my bragging that I called it for a second. Or, or just for forget about that forever at this point. John Dillman is number one. John Dillman is like the anti-vertigo. In a way, it's like the anti-vertigo. We go from like the male gaze movie to like the female experience. This is earth-shattering to the canon in the best possible way. This is the best possible outcome. Only thing that would make it better is if 2001 had placed like my ideal of this like top, I can't for, I cannot believe Bo Travai is number seven. That is by far the most insanely crazy thing about this whole top 10. Oh my God. Well, I guess John Dealman. No, no, this is crazier than John Dealman getting number one is Bo Travai getting number seven. Ah, uh, I think Bo Travai is a little overrated. That's just me. All due respect to everyone who loves it that much. I'll revisit it now. I'll revisit it even more times. But I would have loved to see like John Dealman. John Dealman, 2001, Citizen Kane Vertigo, and then Tokyo Story or something like that. I am, I cannot believe I called that. I have to go over back to my Twitter and see what, if people actually said something to me about this. Guys, <laughs> I can't believe I called John Dealman. Where are the texts? I have to read my text. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. I, I'm just like, I'm speechless. I am utterly speechless. Jermaine, that's right. Nostragamji just struck again. You read that right. I'm renaming my YouTube to Nostragamji. From henceforth, I'll be known as Nostragamji uh, to all you in the film world. And holy actual shit. Holy actual shit. Guys, that concludes this video. Um, probably an hour long video. Uh, I'll be processing this more. I know everyone will be talking about this more. Um, I just want to say that taxi driver and apocalypse now were left off the top 100 is that true passion of joan of arc left off no 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 we had passion right whoa whoa whoa, whoa, whoa. hold on a second hold on a second yeah, okay thank god passion of joan of arc was there taxi driver no no we had taxi driver 29 i'm an idiot there's a lot to keep track of here. Apocalypse Now is 19. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Godfather, only the first one placed. Because you can't you can't decide between the first and second one. This has always been a big problem with, with listing when it comes to the Godfather. Um, eight and a half? Was eight and a half shut out? 
Eight and a half? What? No. Wait. No, 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 no. Sorry, I know I'm going back through like everything. Um, Dolce Vita? No, eight and a half is 31. Oh my gosh, guys, I'm, I'm literally going crazy here. I can't keep up with all this. I'm trying to think if there's any other ones that have fallen off. There's no huge falls. We gotta figure out the first big fall. I wanna know. These are all in, these are all in, 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 in. No, Godfather 2 is out, huh? Is that right? They just like dropped it out. Yeah, Godfather 2 is out, which is just, just think of the first one that's counting for both of them. That's the, that's your best way there. Um, holy cow, guys. Wow. Okay. Thanks for watching. This video has been long enough. I don't know if anyone's even going to ever see this, but I wanted to have this for posterity. That's it. Uh, this has been Sam, the guy who predicted John Dealman five, three minutes before the results came out. Smith and over and out. Take care, guys. Peace.